Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Social Flight Live. I'm Jeff Simon. We have an amazing show for you tonight. Richard Van Grunsman of Vans Aircraft is here. So, so many cool things to talk about. And as usual, before we get started, I just wanted to give you a quick update on things. First of all, a quick thing about using the system for tonight's broadcast. We will be recording tonight's broadcast, and so if you have any challenges or issues uh, or you have to go for some reason, you can always come back and check out our YouTube channel that is search for Social Flight, one word, Social Flight, on YouTube, and uh, usually takes us a day or two to get the uh, broadcast up, but then you'll be able to see it there as well. In addition, uh, as far as navigating the, uh, the app, whether you're on a phone or a tablet or a computer, um, you have a different view and we will be showing some pictures as part of tonight's show. And you can either swipe left or right or also in some cases change the size of the screen if you would like to be able to see the speaker uh, a little larger or the picture a little larger. So there are controls that you can do for that. And lastly, Q&A is available. Uh, we will not be taking direct questions from the audience, but they will feed into questions that uh, will be part of our discussion. And so send your Q&A in. We'll do our best to fit that into the presentation this evening. Now, one other quick thing, of course, you know, here at Social Flight, we are dedicated to, to supporting general aviation. We started Social Flight Live because of the crisis and connecting with uh, general aviation pilots from around the world and helping to support our industry, which is so vulnerable during uh, challenging times. And so um, one of the things that's been really interesting to see is how many things are starting to pick up in general aviation. We're seeing a lot of cases where there are fly-ins happening uh, around the country, as well as events and meetings that are in person. They all seem to have very good safe social distancing practices about limitations on people and distance, et cetera. And so be sure to check out socialflight.com and the free Social Flight mobile apps in order to find out what's happening near you. And of course, you will also see just absolutely dozens and dozens of webinars and things that you can do from home, like tonight's show. So with that, I would like to uh, introduce Richard Van Grundman of Vans Aircraft. Uh, and uh, I'm gonna go and, and click on his uh, camera request right now. Since creating the RV1 in 1965, Richard Van Grunsman, or Van as he likes to go by, has been on a path to change the face of experimental amateur built aircraft as we know it. Beginning in 1972 with the RV3, his company, Vans Aircraft, has sold more plans and kits than any other manufacturer, and their customers have completed over 10 thousand flying aircraft in over 45 different countries. Completion rates for builders currently average up to 1.5 aircraft per day, which is amazing to me. Vans designs are fast, efficient, fun to fly, and most importantly, Vans Aircraft has made home building something nearly anyone can accomplish. With CNC machine cut parts and unparalleled level, level of, of factory support and also community support, and I would also like to mention that in an era of outsourcing and foreign manufacture, Vans is a rarity because so much of their manufacturing is done here in the United States and most of it in Vans factory. Lastly, in 2006, uh, Van was inducted into the Oregon Aviation Hall of Fame. And in November of 2013, he was appointed to EAA's board of directors and Flying Magazine ranked Van number 22 on their 51 Heroes of Aviation labeling him an undisputed leader in kit aircraft manufacturing. Welcome, Van. Hi. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here. I really appreciate uh, you doing that and, and everything that you've really done for the industry in addition to joining us this evening. It, it's truly amazing. Um, tell me what, what led you up to that very, very beginning of forming the company and the RV3. Well, obviously, it's a rather long story. How many hours do you have? <laughs> <laughs> We've got one, but we're going to fit you into to all of it. For most people, it, you know, it's kind of like a, a life's journey. But um, uh, it started, aviation interest started when I was very young and um, in elementary school, whatever. And um, I have a brother that's a year older than myself. and we shared that interest. So we kind of 
helped each other along, read everything we could, uh, visited airports when we could, um, helped it uh, back in the 1930s, my father, our father had flown a little bit, um, just a little beyond the solo stage, I think, and kind of ran out of money in those depression times, but he had an interest in aviation and would talk about his experiences back then, and that just helped our interest along. So uh, uh, built model airplanes, etc. cetera. Um, we, uh, my brother took flying lessons as soon as he was old enough, soloed uh, at age 16, and uh, I kind of followed a year later, did the same, but fortunately by that time, um, I mentioned our father, our dad was interested. So we had been able to purchase uh, at that time old J3 Cub. It was like all of nine years old. So you can put that in perspective as to how old they are now. <laughs> we, well, we had that, that airplane so that um, when I was 15 and a half or whatever, I started taking lessons. Or, oh, I should mention that um, I was raised on a small farm in western oregon and uh, small is in capital letters compared to what agriculture is now the longest uh, flat area we had available was less than 700 feet to put in a runway but we put in a runway we're able to keep the j3 at home when i needed a lesson my brother would have to fly me to the airport which was six, seven miles away and, and get a lesson. So in a way it was pretty idyllic, except that um, uh, money was short. Um, so it wasn't a matter of uh, coming into an aviation family with just open opportunities, but I certainly did have those advantages going in. And um, so I soloed uh, shortly after my 16th birthday, uh, continued to fly as finances permitted. Got my private on my 17th birthday. Got my commercial uh, when I was 18. My flight instructors at age 19. Um, by that time, we'd moved up to a Taylor craft rather than a J3. Um, uh, about that time, I, well, at age 18, I started college. Uh, nearby University of Portland, Portland, Oregon. So, and I was a day student. So we, along with other kids, commuted every day, 25 miles to school and back. Um, entered an uh, engineering program there. Um, about the same time, or a little before, uh, the EAA had been formed, and uh, not a whole lot was known about it in the early days. It was just a little organization back in Wisconsin, but I think in about 1956 or so, uh, first chapter in Oregon formed in Eugene, Oregon, which is 100 miles from here. And I would fly down to meetings there and sometime fly back at night, sometimes stay over and come back the next day. Did that for about a year. So that was kind of getting into the home built side of it. I should mention that um, there had been some home, a lot of home building in Oregon before the war, but that was before my time. But um, the uh, nearby field where my dad had learned to fly was kind of a, a headquarters or a, a, for a home building. There was home building activity there, and he had actually flown a home built, excuse me, a, last, a Longster a parasol airplane after he soloed. So I had an interest in home-built airplanes and awareness of home-built airplanes going back uh, more so than a lot of people in the 50s did because home-builds were pretty rare then. Right. Okay, so um, went to college, continued to fly, wanted to do building, uh, to do aircraft building, but just didn't fit in for time and, and dollars. So um, in college, I, I, uh, the school had Air Force ROTC, which I enrolled in, because again, at that time, military service was, while not an absolute obligation, it was 
kind of handwriting on the wall, if you will. Right. And I figured if I was going to do military service, I might as well um, be in the Air Force and be an officer rather than be drafted and do whatever. Um, I should also mention, though, that I was aware that I had a, a vision issue, a color vision issue, which um, I could get around for civilian flying or at least private flying, but knew it was a, a limitation for military flying. Mm. So, um, uh, and un unfortunately, as I took the Air Force test, that uh, uh, became a barrier. But I had my commission, so after um, uh, Playboy with 125 horse light homing and uh, a bubble canopy and a, what I thought to be a, right back. a sexy looking cowl and so on. But, um, well, that brings me through like 1964 when I left the Air Force, brought the airplane home with me. It was not suitable for flying from a farm strip. The farm strip had turned back into into a farm after we didn't have an airplane there anymore while we were off in the service. Um, but I, I wanted to be able to fly that airplane off of the farm and it, it while it was a good enough airplane, it uh, wasn't optimum. So I just uh, took a while to try and figure out what I could do to make a, a more um, versatile airplane. So within a year after leaving the, uh, being a civilian again, I designed a set, a new set of wings for the airplane and modified a few other things that became the RV-1. And uh, it, it uh, became a, a very much better airplane. And I flew that for, oh, three or four years and put a lot of hours on it. And uh, did a lot of aerobatics even started doing air show flying with it. Wow. Um, but even that was still uh, kind of a hybrid. So um, somebody, some airline pilot in Texas wanted it real bad. So I sold it to him and then uh, designed and started building the RV-3 which took about three years to do and uh, first flew that in um, 1971. That That is not the prototype RV-3, that is a copy that my brother made, that's about the number two RV-3 that was ever flown. But um, that was kind of the evolution from my uh, first home built, the Playboy, to this. And overall, if you superimposed one on top of the other, they would be pretty close, but uh, when it comes to the performance and handling qualities, uh, it uh, was a quantum difference. It's amazing so, to me, uh, Van, the the polish of that plane as a first design, and especially going back to, in this case, here you are, uh, here it is in 1972. Um, that is an incredibly polished looking aircraft. I mean, the lines of it are beautiful. It flows really well. Everything from the, the wheel pants to, to everything across. This is a remarkable difference to what so many uh, people, I think, at the time were really seeing in popular mechanics and other places about what you could build yourself. It, it most didn't look like this. So how, how did you evolve so quickly to such a slick design? Well, I, I don't know if it was quickly or not. There were a few years involved, but uh, um, I, I guess I've got a reasonable eye for, um, art. well, I don't know if we call it artistry, sculpting, whatever it might be, to, um, to create the, well, the lines that, that um, flow and match yeah, each yeah, other. Yeah. I think just, um, Putting the, the Whitman type landing gear on it helped because that sweeps back and makes it look racier. But anyway, that's just what it is. Um, uh, maybe I was lucky. I don't know. Uh, uh, just a matter of uh, applying some basic 
uh, aerodynamic principles, and then again the whatever artistry your can eye bring your eye can bring to it. So, but thank you for the for the compliments. And uh, sometimes it's said that if an airplane looks good, it'll fly good. To a degree, that's true. That looks like an RV4. Yes. So let's talk about kind of the evolution of uh, the some of the other aircraft in the line. Well, the RV3 was a single seat. I sort of mentioned how we evolved into that. And early on, single seat home builds were really the, the norm for a couple of reasons. One, they were smaller, they're easier to build, less expensive. Um, uh, there, there weren't really kits, so you you had to do most of the work yourself. And the smaller the airplane, the less work there would be. So, uh, and not only that, but uh, uh, I thought that for any given engine, you're going to get the most performance with the smallest airplane, with the with being single seat. And um, the RV3 did very well. There was a reasonable demand for single seat airplanes at that time, but things were evolving. There were other airplanes. Um, some of the uh, two seat biplanes were very popular at the time, the Stardusters and such. Um, there were some uh, more cross country airplanes, Thorpe T 18, Mustang II. So there were two seat airplanes that were uh, becoming popular. And uh, as a result, uh, there, was, uh, there were inquiries almost immediately for the two seat version of the RV3 or add another seat. You don't just add another seat without uh, modifying the airplane significantly. So I was reluctant to do that because most of the two-seat airplanes, whether they were biplane or monoplane, didn't have all of the qualities and performance that the RV3 did. So uh, I, I didn't really, I wasn't very confident that I could build a two-seat airplane without losing some of the uh, uh, attractiveness and the appeal of the RV3. But eventually, after a few years, uh, uh, started designing and building the prototype RV4. Took a while because I was kind of a, a well, little more than a one-man business at the time, trying to keep up producing kits for the RV3 and developing a new airplane at the same time. Had limited equipment, limited facilities. Um, it was really uh, very little more than a, a backyard endeavor at the time. So. Uh, uh, it took, well, from 1973 when I started selling parts and plans for the RV3. It took until 1979, so that would be like six years before I got the prototype RV4 flying, and a couple more years before it was really developed to the point that I could offer, uh, well, a reasonably complete kit package for it. But that said, uh, the RV4 was not just a stretched three. There's definitely similarity in the lines in the plan form, but it was uh, a new airplane other than for something like the wheels or the, uh, the propeller spinner, everything was new. Um, but fortunately, did my homework right, I guess, and it turned out to be a, a very high performance airplane, very nice handling qualities, uh, a lot of the RV3 qualities and properties were able to uh, be retained in this. So it um, really opened the business, the market then, because there were more, more people wanting the two seat than the single seat. Right. So uh, uh, the, the uh, sales volume, the production had to expand, I don't know if you say geometrically, but significantly. Right, that make that makes a lot of sense. Now, um, a quick question, of course, you went from RV one to RV three. What happened to the RV two? It was a an airplane. It was a, a flying wing sailplane that I had designed, and was going to build in in short time. Um, didn't work that way. Never did finish it. Parts still hanging up in the barn. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> uh, so nothing really. <laughs> Ever, ever going to materialize. Now, I should say I had a workshop in the 
that I built in the loft of the barn on the family farm. So that's really where where the RV three was built in in the loft of a barn. Wow, that's amazing. That uh, that would be pretty. Like I said, that'd be a pretty cool tour of that barn to be able to see uh, the history well, of some of these aircraft. So well, your next one uh, was, of course, from the four to the six, which I'll bring up one here. Um, again, do you, is there, what's, what's, is there always a plane that either didn't make it out of the barn or something like that, that, that happens when, um, when there's a number that's skipped in your line? <laughs> yeah, there was an airplane. The RV five was a little single seat, um, uh, airplane powered by, a two cylinder Volkswagen engine. And it was sort of an EAA chapter project. Not formally, but uh, a group within the chapter. The two-cylinder Volkswagen engine had been developed by a fellow named Dave Carr. It was called the Carr Twin initially, very similar to the what is now the the Hummel two-cylinder Volkswagen. And he had developed that, and they needed uh, an airframe to test it in. So I designed the RV5, and we built it as a group project, which was an education in itself. We had that airplane uh, rebuilt. So what got? So what made the transition then to to tandem side by side? I mean, from tandem to side by side. It has RV seven wingtips on it. So from that angle, it's hard to tell which it is. It doesn't really matter. The RV. Well, people are never satisfied. I shouldn't say that in the form of a complaint. That's really fortunate that people want. <clears throat> want something that they hope we can supply. So we had the RV4, very uh, successful airplane, but I still had reservations that I could make a side-by-side -side airplane, a fat airplane that would perform that well. And uh, even though from what little I knew of aerodynamics that side-by-side -side does not necessarily mean uh, significantly higher drag, there weren't really airplanes th at that time that side-by-side -side airplanes that could match the RV4. So I was reluctant to lose a lot of both the performance and the um, aerobatic qualities and such that were, were hallmarks of the of the four. But uh, there were enough people who kept asking and I shouldn't say demanding, but uh, that um, I forget how many years into the RV4, maybe five years or so that uh, started um, re or designing an airplane uh, using a lot of the RV4 components and plat plan form like wings and tail, very similar because they worked and um, and developing a side-by-side -side fuselage that um, would be more comfortable and uh, satisfy the people that, that really wanted the airplane more for cross-country purposes rather than the more or less pure sport that I had developed the RV-3 and the RV-4 to, uh, well, the, the niche to fill, if you will. So um, the six... We got that flying in uh, 1986, I believe. And uh, fortunately, it performed quite similar to the four. It was only you know, like maybe three mile an hour slower, still had good aerobatic performance, good climb, good short field. So uh, just by, by being careful and um, trying to keep the weight down and keep the, the aerodynamic drag to a minimum, uh, we're able to come up with a, um, a good package in a side-by-side -side airplane. Not necessarily the fastest. Our airplanes have never been necessarily the fastest cross-country airplanes, but we've always been interested in getting a, a good package, a balance of performance, thus the term total performance that we still use, uh, not to mean that it's best at any one particular thing, but that as a package, it, it has a, um, uh, well, a broad spectrum of qualities that 
people want in an airplane, both performance and handling and um, stability, all of those. Now, this can tell me about the What else do you need to know about the RV? Well, the RV7 uh, didn't happen for about another 14 years, I guess. The RV6 filled the demand pretty well. Uh, the one thing that was happening during this period of time, though, is the kit evolution that um, people wanted airplanes that were easier to build. Uh, components that were more uh, completely developed, just technological advances in the construction of the airplane, uh, as opposed to uh, what the overall package or configuration might be. So the RV-7, um, we, we were upgrading in the, in the meantime, though that um, the RV-8, had happened, you know, the, the tandem uh, improvement over the RV-4 in um, the mid-90s. And uh, the RV-9 actually had, had come into the package as, uh, as, as a um, non-aerobatic airplane, a little uh, fly on, on less power, meant to be a little more economical, a little less uh, demanding in the way of pilot skills. But as these airplanes were being developed, we were upgrading the kits all along. Uh, just just uh, better quality control, better um, all of the individual pieces were processed to a higher degree. So they went together uh, quicker and more accurately, more consistently. Uh, so the RV-6 had, had been a uh, kind of a mature kit and did not have these upgrades incorporated that the new airplanes did. But since it was still uh, the, the, the biggest seller of the several models we had, we wanted to upgrade that kit. Um, but rather than just upgrading the kit and calling it an RV6 special or something else, uh, we made a few changes to the airplane, added a little more wingspan, a little more cockpit space, uh, redesigned the wing or redesigned the airplane so that it would uh, accommodate a slightly larger engine, more fuel, all of the other M words, the more, more, more that, that people want. <laughs> yeah. I say that sort of sarcastically, but uh, not necessarily. Point being here where I'm coming to is that the real major difference on the RV-7 was the kit upgrade. It was really the, the first matched hole tooling airplane that we had. We had started to supply pre-punched skins and pre-punched flat parts mostly. The 7 though is the, the first that really had um, matched hole that uh, essentially eliminated the need for building fixtures and jigging fixtures and such that um, at least um, aluminum airplanes, sheet metal airplanes had always required up to that time. Right. And a lot of people didn't really realize that because they didn't, um, well, people coming in that had never built anything didn't really have the frame of reference to evaluate this kit from that kit. We obviously did and uh, knew what was going to be advantageous and otherwise. So um, I'm sorry it's taken a little long to get around to that, but the seven was not just a six on steroids. It was uh, a, a quantum change in the kit itself. And and so did you know, of course, in your planning, since you go, you you had the six, you, you mentioned that they didn't really come out in sequential order the uh according to date so you you must have already known that that was what you were going to do with that spot for a seven while you're already you know where it got the eight out and things like that how, so how does well, that generally work? some of it is happenstance as much as anything when we did the rv8 the tandem the upgrade tandem uh, uh it was like well well at uh, the r we'll just take the rv4 and double it 
So that oh. was an eight. <laughs> That's now not, I get it. <laughs> no, not really. The RV7 had been, the, the, the number had been sort of set aside for a possible four place later on. But then when, when we developed the airplane, decided we weren't going to call it an RV6 special or whatever, that we said, well, we might as well use the seven, get that number you know, off of the, the drawing board. So it, um, in, in that it had been sort of reserved, we skipped ahead to the eight and then the nine and then realized that, well, we might as well use that number. It, <laughs> now yeah, here we have a picture not, here of a not horseshoe. Not that important, other than if if you're into numerology or whatever, you're trying to track the lineage. But uh, there's not always a good explanation. There's not, not always real good logic behind it. But uh, that's kind of the way it worked. Yep. And so tell me about that. That you know the RV8 is what we've got up here. At least a couple of them in this four ship. Um, what that that is an, yeah. an amazing plane unto itself. As, as I mentioned, the the RV6 became very popular, much uh, higher uh, sales volume than the four had been, and it started to supplant the RV4. The RV4 sales then, the market was somewhat saturated for the tandem airplane, and uh, there was questions within our company leadership at the time whether we should just drop the tandem and go with the big seller. I still had a warm spot in my heart for the tandem configuration and really felt that if we could incorporate um, the side-by-side -side type amenities, in other words, the, the greater space, a little more baggage, a little more fuel, a little more of a cross-country suitable tandem airplane, so that was the the, the uh, thought process behind it, and that's what we did, and it obviously uh, worked very well. Uh, the airplane was um, on, uh, even though it's a little more wingspan, definitely a, a more spacious fuselage, um, and a, well, the engine cowling is a full cowl. Um, an advantage there, it gives you more space inside to put things rather than really having to crowd exhaust systems and everything into that tight but sexy looking cowl we had on the RV4. Um, it was, a, I forget, a little heavier than the RV4 because it was bigger, but on a, a comparable engine, it lost only two or three mile an hour, which in wow. the real world, you don't even notice. Right. On paper, for bragging rights, a couple mile an hour makes a difference. But uh, if you're flying from here, from the West Coast to Oshkosh, it makes 10 minutes difference, you know, big right. deal. So um, for, for the amenities that we're able to incorporate in that, it was definitely, um, we're starting to be able to incorporate um, better um, kit upgrade features in it. So um, it became a reasonably popular airplane. Never did sell on the same level as a side-by-side. -side. That's just kind of where the, the preference is, um, but has been a, uh, a steady selling airplane. Uh, I forget how many RV-8s are now flying. 13 or 1400, so it's not insignificant by any means, and uh, a very dedicated following. You can see a lot of the RV-8s have um, military type paint schemes, and yep. it just sort of goes with that configuration. Sometime when you see military paint schemes like put on an Urkoop, it's like, uh, <laughs> you know, or you're kidding here, but uh, whatever it may be, uh, to each his own. My, my point though is that the airplane has lines, and, and particularly with the the tail wheel, the eight versus the Trigear eight A, has lines a lot like the the World War II pursuit fighter aircraft, and um, yeah, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with nostalgia and a little Walter Mitty maybe. Right. 
So here we have the nine. The nine um, came along. Uh, yeah, it's a little hard to explain exactly the motivation for it, other than uh, I had come to think that there were people out there that wanted to build and wanted this kind of an airplane, but really didn't think that there. Uh, we felt that there were people out there that wanted an airplane that was a little more docile, a little more lower landing speed, a um, uh, little stiffer control maybe than what we had in, on our other airplanes. And just looking at a, some of the other airplanes that were popular at the time that fit more into the 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 lower speed, the uh, shorter field capability, et cetera, uh, right. that we uh, uh, also there was about that time um, another category of airplanes proposed that never got off the ground that uh, a trainer version of this airplane would have suited. So this was the nine was almost like a, a trainer um, Got it. creation of the six. Um, so with the longer wing, lighter wing loading, uh, more effective flaps, we had a stall speed that was around seven mile an hour less. May not sound like a lot, but in the real world, that makes a lot of difference. It just gives you yeah. uh, a lot. And not only that, but the airplane just felt more solid at the yeah. lower speeds. And That's definitely a big, big difference. An easier uh the lower lower scale requirement for that airplane. Not only that, but with the nine, we came out with um, the tricycle gear. We didn't really anticipate a tailwheel version of that airplane. It's mm. only later that we developed the tri, pardon me, the tailwheel RV9, just because some people still wanted tailwheels. We put the the tri gear on it because that was the the um, well the 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 pilot base that we were uh, intending for the airplane. So um, just all of the above: lower landing speed, uh, tr tricycle gear, ground stability, uh, and um, it was never our most popular airplane, but it definitely found a following, and uh, uh, it was a great airplane to fly regardless yeah. of what your pilot skill level is. Makes a lot of sense. Now the next one, of course, the 10, I remember when people even got a whiff of this airplane coming out from you, it made the entire industry start buzzing and probably ringing your phone off the hook. Well, the, the 10, the interest in the 10 or the four seat goes way back, but uh, we were, hesitant to to try and develop a four-seat airplane we certainly weren't the first in the industry uh hesitant because it was going to be a bigger airplane it was going to be uh take be more time consuming to build it's going to be more expensive uh and not only that but there were uh to a de to a degree uh, home-built airplanes compete with used factory airplanes from the Bonanzas, the, the the Cessna Cardinals, the Comanches, and all of that. As time went on, these airplanes got older and less desirable. And the other thing is that our kits, we were able to upgrade the kits to the point that now a four-seat airplane was something that we could anticipate that a builder could do, um, whereas it would have been a more astronomical challenge 10 or 15 years before. So it's like these paths sort of converged. The, the less concern about competition from uh, old airplanes that were getting older and more tired, and then having the uh, technology to, to build a, uh, a good matched hole uh, four seat airplane. So uh, that's what led us, and, and also we, Kind of ran out of ran out of things to do with two seat airplanes, so uh, 
the path just crossed. We developed that. It uh, was first flown in 2003, I believe, and within a couple of years had uh, the kits out. And it has obviously proven to be uh, quite popular, but that said, never in numbers similar to the two seat. Right. It still does. It is still, even though the, the, the kit technology is good, it's still a big airplane, still takes time to, to build and, and more money. The engine's bigger, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, you know, it, it, it turned out to be a, a fabulous airplane, and it's really taken a, quite a few years before uh, the aviation world has, has really accepted that. Um, with the 10, particularly with the publicity we've gotten recently from the AOPA sweepstakes airplane, yep, a, a broader uh, percentage of the pilot base has, has realized that it's not just another home-built airplane that it's really uh, right up on par with what the factories can turn out. And you can do this yourself for you know, 20% or 30% the cost of a, a factory airplane. Yeah, and a lot of people would argue a lot better than, than anything else that you can buy. It's, it's an amazing airplane, definitely is. Now, now you said something, you said you ran out of things to do with the two-seaters, but of course, the next thing that you did is you went back to two seaters. <laughs> well, about that time, the yes, the the light sport uh, rules came into effect, and um, there had been a lot of uh, hype and a lot of publicity about that. That we were going to, uh, well, we got uh, a new set of regulations that were going to facilitate um, a low cost, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, two seat airplane, entry level airplane. Uh, I think we've all come to realize that uh, the uh, the target there was never completely achieved, particularly in in the cost category. Uh, the realities of economics set in, and uh, the airplane was um, the light sport type airplane was never really as affordable as we had hoped. We did not get in on the ground floor of that because we were busy developing um and uh, well the the line of airplanes we had particularly the, um, the rv-10 which took a, took a while to really get, to get the kit completely developed and in production so we were kind of the the late comers in the in the light sport with the rv-12 but kind of realizing that i wanted to uh, incorporate some features into that that provided a better package than maybe some of the competition had. And one of the things was the remo removable wings for trailering. And if it's going to be an inexpensive airplane, it's going to appeal to people that can't necessarily afford expensive hangars at the big airports. Well, as it turns out, that is not necessarily true. Uh, the, the trailerable airplane has been uh, something that has been been um, around for a long time, never really caught on for a lot of reasons. But that's still a feature that we have. Uh, it, there are other maintenance advantages to having that uh, feature on the airplane. The other, um, since the airplane was uh, by light sport rules, uh, had to meet a uh, fairly low stall speed. It had to have a fairly big wing. Uh, we wanted the airplane to be comfortable, and the rules kind of say it, it can't go too fast. You know, it had the 120 knot uh, limit imposed. That didn't, doesn't mean that you could make a, a, a super simple boxy airplane, and it would still go 120 knots. But uh, uh, speed wasn't the, the absolute goal, so we wanted to have a um, comfortable cabin, big cabin, particularly wanted um, superb uh, view, uh, visibility out of the cabin or the canopy of the airplane. So these were some of the things that we um, were targets when we laid out the airplane that we hoped we would set it apart from some of the other lights, well, the practically dozens of other light sport airplanes that were 
uh, entering the field at the time. So uh, it um, it met our goals and maybe exceeded in in some respects. And uh, uh, while the light sport category was really created for production airplanes more than kit airplanes, um, we developed the airplane feeling that there would be a sufficient kit market for the airplane to justify it, even if we didn't choose to enter production on it. So most of the airplanes up to this time have been kit airplanes. It's only in the last few years that we've been able to uh, start limited uh, production on a flyaway airplane. Mm. Another two-seat airplane, the RV-14. And some people have asked, well, gee, it looks a lot like an RV-7. Why did you do that? Part of the reason was the, 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 the big M factor, the more, more, more uh, uh, consideration. The RV-10 had proven to be such a great airplane that uh, the field of view was even better than the two-seat airplanes we had. The cabin comfort was definitely um, wonderful. And then it was like some people really liked the 10, but they really didn't need the four seats. It's like, man, it, it's just wonderful, but I, I don't need that many seats. So in a way, the, the 14 was a scale down RV-10. Hmm. Interesting. Kind of a, a, a marriage of the 7 and the 10. So, and, and the wing on the RV-14 is the same airfoil section, uh, just a different span than we use on the RV-10, the same flap system, et cetera. So uh, uh, mainly then it was a matter of, uh, of um, incorporating a little more power in the, the big M word, um, more baggage area, we uh, redesigned the canopy so it, it was a deeper canopy. You just have a better field of view. Um, sit up higher, a little more of this, a little more of that. <laughs> and um, again, it has, has proven to be um, a great airplane, it performs well. Uh, on a given engine, the RV 7 and 6 will still do better, but they don't have uh, all of the other features, fuel capacity, baggage capacity, etc. cetera. So um, in addition to that, we the, the kit for the 14 is noticeably improved over the other airplanes. So we, we keep, um, keep working on what is really, uh, in some cases, an overlooked feature, and that is the buildability of the airplane. Uh, and and uh, the people that have built the 14, there's a number of people who built an RV-14 that had built other of our airplanes before, and they will testify that it, uh, as, as far as the buildability, the accuracy, et cetera, is uh, a definite upgrade. Every airplane we've come out with in the last 20 years has been significantly better in that respect, easier to build more consistent, uh, et cetera. And uh, one reason that a lot of home-built airplanes never get finished is the frustration factor, that after a time, a person just has so much energy, a limited amount of energy, to put into a project. And uh, if you go way back 40 years or whatever to the plans built airplanes, a very small percentage were ever finished. And there are a lot of um, bones <laughs> laying around in workshops and, and hangars and so on. And even, even with kit airplanes, there's a lot of unfinished kits because uh, kits span a pretty broad spectrum from those that are, uh, well, first that are gonna result in a really useful, good airplane when you're finished. And the other is that uh, have the inherent qualities that make them finishable. Uh, if, if a kit is too much of a challenge, any builder will tell you he can get frustrated after a period of time and just 
just kind of run out of energy. Nothing mm -hmm. really wrong other than that. So again, this has been one of our goals in the 14. We're seeing completion times that are um, definitely on the short uh, span of months and years. So uh, I think that the efforts we put into upgrading that kit are definitely paying off. In addition so, to that, a great airplane when you're finished. So Van, with all the big M's, that's the big theme of the night of, of the evolution of your aircraft uh, and, and the more and more and more that people keep asking you for, what, what, what kind of category would you put what you're hearing the most now for where, you, where the company might go next? Is it, is it more in performance or is it more in buildability like you were just talking about? Um, what, what, what do you hear most from people? Well, we haven't really done a formal survey. Uh, every now and then we'll get a, a thread on the internet like Vans Air Force site uh, where people will start talking about what Vans should do next, next <laughs> what they would like to see, what they think we will do. And that usually goes from alpha to omega, I guess. <laughs> but um, uh, I really I should, don't know. I should say, what are you most interested in? There, in there has been a trend in recent years to, um, uh, you know, toward the, the, the well, maybe simpler flying, uh, more local flying or outback flying. There's, there's definitely. Um, an interest in a number of uh, airplanes available to fit that 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 need, so that's definitely a consideration along with just upgrading what we already have. But um, right now we've got a fleet of a, quite a number of airplanes, and just keeping up and maintaining and making improvements and correcting whatever needs to be corrected, it, it keeps us pretty busy. And uh, th that's something that uh, it's hard to understand un unless you're in the trenches doing it. So it's not like, oh, well, you finished that three years ago. Why haven't you done something else? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, we would like to. Most of us would far prefer to, to dig into something new and exciting rather than um, uh, trudging along doing the, the necessary day-to-day -day, uh, work on, on keeping up and uh, providing the service, providing the upgrades, making a good our We have a bit of a challenge. Like I said, our connection to Van's home this evening is having some issues, but uh, we are going to make up on that with uh, uh, um, having... Are you back, Van? No, I thought I was here all along. <laughs> you hear me? Well, yeah, we're 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 at the end of our time, but what I would love to do is see if we could have you back um, when uh, we can do that. And I apologize to anyone who has had issues right now with the uh, audio or video on that. We did have an issue with uh, uh, our connection that's going out um, right now uh, to uh, the West Coast there. And um, uh, Van, if you'll have us, we'd love to have you back and uh, and get that worked out and talk not only about the uh, aircraft but about what's happening there uh, at, the, at the factory, what kind of things you're looking at um, in, into the future, the other, the people there that are running things right now, and, um, and, and what's next in the future of general aviation and in Vans Aircraft. Yeah, I'd be glad to do that, and sorry for the, any, any of the technical problems we had here. We kind of had to change our broadcast site a little bit at the last minute, and that might have um, cause some of the technical problems and yeah if we did we'd plan ahead we could get more shots uh, of the things at the factory to uh, to talk about and we'd love to do that yeah well um, I'll tell you we have a, an enormous list of questions that have come in from the audience oh, far far more than we could ever fit into uh, even another hour show but if you like I said if you'll have it I would love to schedule it for another broadcast we will make sure that we have a, a solid connection there and um, and most importantly, be able to get into so, so much more to talk about. I'll tell you, just to give you a preview, we have tons of questions coming in about 
electric aircraft in the future, what's happening in the factory, how things are, uh, what's your support plan for, for such a broad range of aircraft. Um, and, and again, uh, uh, I just appreciate you taking the time this evening to join us and uh, be able to reach such a broad audience. You have a lot of fans out there, rightly so, and I am very, very much one of them. Well, thank you very much, and uh, I, I definitely enjoy that, uh, particularly answering questions, because then we can talk about something they want to hear rather than something I want to say, and <laughs> rather than me just droning on and on, uh, we can get more interchange that way. So uh, whenever we can work that in, I'd be glad to do it. Absolutely. So everyone who uh, is dialed in now, keep an eye out on the schedule. All you have to do is log in and register at socialflight.com. And also, as you registered for the Social Flight Live series here, we will schedule Richard Van Grunsven again for uh, another appearance where we will go through more questions and what's coming up next for Van's aircraft. Again, Van, thank you so, so much for taking your time this evening. And thank you to all of you who have joined us here for Social Flight Live, helping to support general aviation. And we really appreciate your patience with this evening's broadcast and any issues. Until next time, I'm Jeff Simon for Social Flight. Blue skies. <laughs>